People are different, no question about it, on their conservatism, their liberalism, you call that ideology, religious ideology, they've got very different opinions about things, want to take those opinions seriously. There's um, some pretty serious conflicts that arise from those differences. Moral evaluations even arise from those differences. The religious people are stupid, the atheists are cruel, whatever. I mean, it gets really personal in a hurry. I don't know if you spend a lot of time reading comments on the web around new atheism or something, but, but it, can, it, can get, it can get nasty really fast. So to avoid that, usually these discussions split off and the atheists have their little corner, the super religious people have their little corner and they talk to each other because it's too dangerous to talk to each other. It gets too hot, too quick. The links between religiosity and personality are fascinating, just fascinating. Some people are willing to do things that others wouldn't dream of. It's got something to do with personality, it's got something to do with cultural formation in groups. We want to understand that. We want to increase empathic awareness of religious differences. So this is an anti-Sharia law demonstration in Toronto. There's a pretty energized fight going on right now. This is a very complicated issue. But can you see it from the other person's point of view? We want to understand how to do that. Understand, understand social patterns of religious conflict also. I love that cartoon. Um, <laughs> it takes a little while to absorb. Respect should be two-way. That's the message of that cartoon. Everyone should be respecting everyone else. Up to a point, I mean, there can be behavior that you don't want to respect. That's fine. But there's a whole bunch of kinds of lack of respect in our culture that don't seem productive, that don't seem prophetically on target, that don't seem morally useful. They just seem wasteful, sort of violent, destructive. Uh, we also want to improve the training of religious leaders. People like yourselves, we think either in seminary or after seminary that religious leaders can make one of the big differences by learning some of the things that we've discovered and applying them in their lives. We'd also like to help people manage the stress of pastoral ministry. There are a lot of stresses, conflict causes stress, Ministers routinely report that congregational conflict is one of the things that's hardest to bear, hardest to resolve, most annoying, most distracting from what they feel is their most important calling. And you can get really good at managing it in a certain sense, but it would be so great if every now and again you could actually not just manage conflict, but reconcile, actually get somewhere, wouldn't it? Isn't that what the gospel's about? That's what would reduce stress, if we could actually transform conflict, not just cope with it. Uh, we're also interested in supporting radically inclusive religious communities, even when they're ideologically diverse. How did they do that? And I wanted to understand that. I, I wanted to get geek on that. I wanted to really get how that happened. Not to replicate it necessarily, but to understand whether the polarization of congregations, which is what normally happens, whether it's inevitable. Do congregations mostly have to be politically one side or the other? All right, this Spectrums project then, I've described it, but I haven't told you anything that we've learned yet. All I've told you is what our goals were, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time doing that so you could understand where I'm coming from. I want to introduce to you a phrase, understanding-based empathy. Understanding-based empathy. The question that takes us to this phrase is, can you explain your ideological opponent deeply, accurately, sympathetically, so that your ideological opponent says, yes, you understand me, you've got me, you know what's most important to me, you know what I would go to bat for, you know what I would never compromise on, you can say it, I feel understood by you. Can we do that? The huge challenge is that to do that, you need to understand the other person. And I don't mean hand-holding pastoral understanding. I mean, you actually need to understand their worldview. 
You need to understand their ideas and their convictions. You actually have to learn something. Have you ever felt deeply understood, accurately understood by an ideological opponent? Have you ever had that experience? I'd love to see. Have you ever felt so understood by an ideological opponent that you feel like you're humanly connected with them despite your disagreement? A few. Well, that is a tragically low number of hands, people. That's a very sad commentary on our world. This understanding-based empathy is a pathway to this experience. It's an experience that you can give to other people and it's an experience that you can have for yourself. Understanding-based empathy can't be faked. You can't just want to be empathic based on understanding. Good-hearted people will, will often connect with you humanly in a crisis, for example, and your ideology doesn't matter. Well, that's not understanding-based empathy. It's empathy, it's valuable, maybe even more important than understanding-based empathy, especially in a crisis. But understanding-based empathy requires you to know the other person's ideas, why they think that way. It's easier to achieve than heart-to-heart -heart empathy. Heart-to-heart -heart empathy is complicated. It requires all kinds of psychological processing. It requires, I mean, heart-to-heart -heart empathy is the sort of thing you want with a spouse, for example, or a dear, dear lifelong friend. You know them well enough for the gears of your differences to grind up against each other. Right? And anyone who's been married for more than five years knows what I'm talking okay. about. The differences are precious, right? But they, they complicate life. They complicate life big time. And heart-to-heart -heart empathy, to understand the other person from their point of view, that is a life calling. It's a major operation. Think of encounter groups. Are any of you old enough to remember encounter groups? Oh, those things give me the willies. <laughs> encounter groups seem so threatening to me because it's such a demanding process of personal exploration individually in order to be able to connect to other people. Understanding-based empathy is not like that. It's not a high-energy exercise. It's a low energy exercise that just about anyone can do so long as they've got the relevant information and they're willing to learn. This is why we, this is why we press understanding-based empathy as a technique for managing conflict because it's easier. It works with ideological enemies as well as with allies. My ideological partners, the people who agree with me, I might be able to understand them just by understanding myself. But the very same understanding-based empathy can be extended to enemies too, ideological enemies. It's hard, you have to, but it's not as hard as in countergroups, but it still works. It's realistic about deep differences between people. It doesn't require any homogenization. It doesn't require anyone to pretend that, well, you should think like I do. Nothing like that. It lets deep differences be differences. It's one of the principles of dialogue, in fact. But understanding-based empathy is a lot easier than dialogue. Dialogue gets very complicated in a hurry. And it helps people feel closely bonded without having to agree. I've um, spoken with people where there are um, uh, very conservative and very liberal people in the audience. I've attempted to describe to each, each side of the room what the other side most cares about. The other side, the each side will say, yes, you've described us correctly. And the other side says, oh my goodness, I never knew that that's what was most important to you. I never knew. Why didn't I know that? They feel immediately bonded to each other after that. Just because they, they, can, they understand how each other ticks. It's so important. But it, they don't agree with each other. They don't leave the room with a changed political opinion. Not one single opinion changes. But they feel more humanly connected. That's the secret of understanding-based empathy. You only need information and willingness. You don't need emotional competence. You don't need to be able to drown yourself in complicated emotions in encounter groups. No, you don't need to. But you do need the information. So what understanding matters? What kind of information helps? Conservatives and liberals need one another. I'll explain more about that in a moment, but that's a key point. The way they need each other is important. 
Moderates can be an intentional and principled. They can see both sides of a conflict and they want to protect their ability to support the weak side so that the tension can be maintained and none of the wisdom lost. That is a very profound reason to be a moderate. And you can be a radical moderate with that viewpoint. And there are plenty of moderates who are thoughtful, political and religious people who want to stay in the middle for a reason. Religious and political ideology is partially heritable. Did you know that? This is figured out using twin studies. Twins. <laughs> Marvelous things, twins. And I don't know if you know about the twin studies uh, coming out of Minnesota and whatnot, but uh, twins are the, one of the most precious resources in the universe for studying the culture and nurture, nature-nurture distinction. Right? How much is biological and how much is uh, basically uh, channeled into you by your cultural environment, such as a family or your neighborhood or your school system or something else. And the, the, the twin studies, they find both twins who were raised together and twins who were separated at birth. And because they were separated at birth, they were raised in different environments. That's so the perfect statistical uh, leverage that you need to study. And in this process, they discover that religious and political ideology go together. Conservatism, religiousness, and a fondness for hierarchy are all co-inherited at about the same rate as handedness. That's interesting. That means that there's a biological factor that predisposes us to be at one point or another on the ideological spectrum. Powerful roots in the brain, we'll talk a lot more about that today, but that's where this heritability works. It works through the brain, through the way the brain functions. So it's not all culture. There's a biological component, but the biology doesn't determine what happens. It sets up, if you like, constraints like a river bank. But the river can still flow and move. In the same way there's freedom for people to be the kinds of people they want to be religiously and ideologically within the constraints set by biology. Ideological preferences depend on temperament. They stabilize after about age 25. Why 25? You need a few years to get out of the family home, the family context, to be able to figure out where you're really at, and for your natural temperament to take over and make its proper full contribution to your ideological posture. Also, it's by age 25 that you have full control over yourself. The, um, the way the brain develops, uh, um, what, what you need to do is to make connections to the motor planning parts of your brain um, into the regulative parts of your brain, the parts that coordinate, that make judgment, that decide whether something's smart or not. Right? That requires axons to stretch forwards into the frontal cortex of your brain. And those axons, they stretch forward, but they're not insulated very well when you're young. They get insulated in women first, earlier. Why? Because in the evolutionary history of our species, women need to raise children. You have to have impeccable judgment to be able to do that. But they don't, those, the insulation doesn't grow in men. It's not finished growing until age 25. Why? Because if you want to get protein to feed the baby back at home, what do you have to do? Take outrageous risks with dangerous animals. You have to fight off marauding hordes who want to take your baby and your woman away. Right? You have to do that man battle sports thing. Brr, that thing. You know, you have to do that thing. And if you've got, if you've got properly insulated, bionized axons projecting into your frontal cortex, you're in trouble because you're going to be making good judgments. You're going to be saying things like, hey, that doesn't seem safe. <laughs> I, I don't think I should take on that bison, right? Or, wait, if me and my friends run into the woods to attack those people that are in there, aren't we possibly going to get hurt or die? <laughs> you're going to be able to make those calculations. And so you're going to be useless as a protein provider and as a protector of the clan. So evolution got rid of people like that. And it focused on having, uh, having males develop properly insulated um, signaling into the control centers of the brain later than women. 
that's partly why you can't finish developing your ideas about ideology until you get to 25, until the biology catches up. Conservatism increases with age. As far as we know, this isn't a brain thing. We think this happens because as you live longer, you see enough about the world to discover that the thing those crazy liberals would be happy to get rid of, that terrible institution that's being unjust, that's hurting people, let's get rid of it. As you get older, you realise, dang, that thing was hard to build. And I've seen countries where they don't have that thing, you know, judicial system, whatever it is. And in those countries, it's even worse. We can't get rid of that thing. Reform it, yes, but we can't get rid of it. So enough experience causes people to value achieved complexity in social organisation. That's why people tend to become more conservative with age. They don't get super conservative, but they do shift to the right one or two points in the course of their lifetime, from 25 to 65 or 75. They shift one or two points to the right. People can be religiously liberal and conservative in different ways. It's another big finding. Um, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit of detail right now. But the general point to take home here is that we're not used to thinking about liberal and conservative as anything other than opposites. We're used to thinking of them on a line. Liberal on the left, conservative on the right. And if you're not this, you're this. And if you're this, you're not that. But we've discovered that liberalism and conservatism in religion, and in politics by the way, but in religion, which is what I'm focusing on today, it's a multi-dimensional idea. Let me explain what I mean. Here's the first dimension of three. The first dimension in religious ideology has to do with belief. You can have, uh, you can have a left side meaning about purpose, the world is for enjoying and improving, and that's an essential part of salvation or liberation. Or you can have a right side meaning, the world is the stage in which salvation or liberation to a higher realm plays out. Both of those views are together in churches, in synagogues, in mosques. But one's leftish and one's rightish. With regard to reality, the left meaning tends to be natural. Ultimate reality is like or works through natural processes where the rightish meaning is that ultimate reality is another realm of reality and it works into this, it reaches into this world to help. With regard to authority, left people tend to have dialogical understandings of authority, whereas right people tend to have definitive understandings of authority, not negotiable, rooted in external sources. With regard to hermeneutics or interpretation, left meanings tend to be metaphorical, whereas right meanings tend to be literal. Now typically, most people line up, if they tend to be rightish, they tend to line up rightish on all of those things, or they tend to line up leftish on all of those things. But the thing is, there are exceptions. Our research shows that some people will flip on one or two of these. They might be generally rightish, for example, but when it comes to hermeneutics, maybe they have a literature degree or something, and they really care about metaphor, and they see power in metaphor and images, and they're not interested in literalism. They don't think that's true to the nature of the text or something. So they go leftwards on that issue. Now, the instruments that we build are sensitive enough to detect those kinds of differences. See, how, how different is that from a seven-point scale, from liberal to conservative and just say what you are? The second dimension is praxis. The leftish meaning of community the community subdimension is inclusive. You include people with different beliefs, within limits, not just anyone. <laughs> the rightish meaning is that full membership requires agreement with identity defining beliefs. On ritual, the left meaning is diffuse. Rituals are used inconsistently and not for solving problems but for a kind of togetherness. Whereas they're focused on the rightish meaning, rituals are deployed in consistent ways to solve problems. If you're on the right, you know what ritual to deploy, for what reason, you know how to do it. If you're on the left, you might be thinking up new rituals for today, or, you know, let's just try this one. You wouldn't do that. That's not a rightish way of thinking about ritual. <clears throat> on faith, questing on the left, whereas following on the right, 
social dynamics, the left meaning is radical. You advocate change as a creative quest for well-being, but on the right it's conventional. You resist social change because you want to express trust in the gyroscope that tradition is. The wisdom that's encoded in tradition should be preserved. It should be trusted. You can't just go reinventing the meaning of marriage. That's a very serious institution. You can't just go doing that according to the right. right? Social roles, egalitarian on the left, but hierarchical on the right. Once again, rightish people tend to line up and leftish people tend to line up on those five sub-dimensions, but there are lots of exceptions and subtleties. And finding ways to measure those subtleties has felt to us like a much more dignified way of connecting with people, of understanding the way people can feel about religion, about ideology, about being liberal or conservative. The third dimension is morality. And we didn't discover these five sub-dimensions. These came from work by Jonathan Haidt and Jesse Graham. Jesse Graham's one of our team members. Um, they discovered that there are f five dimensions of moral reasoning that are very deeply built inside us, and we find them just as important in religion as they are in politics. There's the harm-care dimension, which comes from fundamental attachments that we have to our loved ones. That's biologically rooted. And the virtues and ideals, kindness, gentleness, and nurturance. Then there's the fairness and reciprocity thing, which comes from the evolutionary story about reciprocal altruism. You build stronger groups by exchanging things with each other, right? But for that, you need justice, you need rights, you need autonomy. And then you've got in-group and loyalty. We're tribal creatures. We form shifting coalitions. We, we have limited resources. We need to be kind to the people who are inside our group and we need to monitor the group boundaries to avoid free riders from coming in and taking advantage of our resources and not contributing anything in return. So patriotism, self-sacrifice for the group, one for all and all for one, this togetherness thing. Authority and respect, hierarchical social interactions have turned out to be much more efficient than fully egalitarian ones. The most egalitarian civilizations, cultures, I mean, we've ever had, were small-scale tribal cultures. Every time we've tried to put people together in larger numbers, <clears throat> beyond just a couple of thousand, egalitarianism doesn't work. Hi hierarchicalism is the thing that takes over. So deference to legitimate authority, respect for traditions. And then there's the purity-sanctity dimension, which comes from the psychology of disgust and contamination. Think of a piece of food with that green mold on it, like a piece of fruit that dropped on the, on the ground. It's fun to look at maybe, but if you thought about eating it, reach down to touch it, you probably wouldn't touch it, right? And if you got close to it and thought about putting it close to your mouth, what would happen to your face? You'd go, that disgust look, right? you get that disgust look. It's an inbuilt protection to help us avoid contaminants. People who don't have the disgust reaction, they get sick. They eat food they shouldn't. They don't survive. People who do survive much better. <clears throat> and as a spiritual, that, that whole biological thing is, uh, is extended into spirituality. The body is a temple that can be desecrated by immoral activities and contaminants. It's kind of metaphorical extension, but it really, it really entrains all of that disgust biological neurology. It gets it going. Right? All right. I've told you about 14 different sub-dimensions, liberal, conservative, 14 different ones clustered in three major dimensions, belief, praxis, and morality. This, we think, is the sort of cutting-edge picture of ideology in religion. And people are not just neatly one thing or the other. They are all over the map. And when you chart people, or when you do the graphs of where people are, you see little off-diagonal clusters. You see, you see uh, people expressing themselves as they try to understand the world the best they can. Biologically conditioned in a certain way by, their, by their, uh, the heritable aspects of ideology, but free to contest those things and to modify them and to use them to be the kind of person that they want to be. Bio-cultural. <coughs> Bio, cultural, both at once, always together. I wanted to tell you about personality type. When you run 
the ideology thing, are you liberal or conservative, against personality tests, you get typical personality types. <coughs> the liberal personality type, open to new experiences, creative and curious. They're agreeable, cooperative, considerate. They're extroverted, energetic, assertive, talkative. They tend to be neurotic, stressed, worried, nervous, moody, and less conscientious, disorganized, distracted. Whereas the conservative personality type is less open to new experiences, likes routines, less agreeable, critical, quarrelsome, aloof, introverted, reserved, quiet, show, shy, low in energy, low in energy, less neurotic, relaxed, handles stress well, stable, and conscientious, reliable, persistent, organized. Now I myself personally can think of tons of exceptions to this. So what are we talking about? Averages. We're trying to learn about averages. There is a liberal personality type on average. There is a conservative personality type on average, but there are always exceptions. Averages in statistics look like bell curves, right? You describe the middle of the bell, but there are all kinds of other things happening. It's just that they don't happen as often. So you can still learn something about personality and religious connections, even though you're not going to learn about everyone in infinite detail. So now why do we need each other? Remember that was the first thing I listed on uh, the, the research promise, uh, the things that we've learned? Conservatives and liberals need each other. Conservatives understand how precious social forms are and how easy they are to lose. They do what it takes to protect society and keep it running efficiently. Liberals understand how precious individual lives are and how easily they can be harmed. They do what it takes to protect individuals and optimize well-being. Now if you're like me and you're a computer geek or a math geek, which is where I started my life in mathematics and sciences, what you see here is two optimization processes that are not in complete harmony with each other. Possibly. The first one is trying to optimize energy. Energy is a scarce resource. It takes a lot of energy to maintain anything important or valuable. In order to protect energy, to use it wisely, you need to be smart about it. You have to optimize energy. That's the specialist contribution of the conservatives. But human lives can't be understood by averages. Human lives have to do with individual pains and joys and sorrows. They have to do with the infinitely intricate journeys that we all go on. How do you value that? If you just focus on institutional life, individual lives get chewed up all the time. And they get chewed up in such a way that you sort of don't even see it because the chewing up happens on the edges. And everyone who fits into the big group, well, are doing fine. Where's the problem? The problem is on the edges, on the undersides of whatever civilizational order you've got. Liberals are the ones who empathically connect to the intricacy and beauty of every individual life. And they're the ones who will transform society, protest society, do what they have to, to honor the beauty and the glory of each individual person. Now, from my point of view, these two optimization processes are essential. You cannot have a civilization without them. You can't have any complicated social form without them. What you need to do is think about what happens when food is, is, is scarce. What do you need to solve that problem? Organization, hierarchy, institutions, large trucks, that, airplanes that can move food from someplace where they can grow it across here where we can't. You need pipelines that take water from Northern California to Southern California where they don't have it so the people in Southern California can drink stuff. Right? You need civilizations. You need both. It can't all be about just caring for each other and feeling each other's pain and worrying about justice. And it can't all be about institutions, let's protect everything and forget the individual. We haven't done this yet, but we're about to. In the Simulating Religion Project, we're trying to build models that test out whether groups are more stable when they have both optimization processes running well. We think it's the case that they are. We would like to produce a theoretical proof of it. 
Now, I don't think that would influence what I'm saying today at all, but I just wanted to share that because I'm so excited about having a shot at doing that. No one's been able to do this before, right? To actually prove in the way a scientist might, to actually prove, not just say it, but prove that liberals and conservatives need each other. That we're built to be diverse ideologically, because if we're not built that way, our civilizations will fall apart. Let's talk about conservative and liberal brains, personalities and churches. Why is gay marriage ordination, participation and leadership such a touchy issue? It's one of those hot button issues, isn't it? But why is it? Why are our conversations about this like that picture? Right? I think the research on moral foundations theory really helps us understand not just that issue, but other hot button issues too. This graph is going to be really helpful. So let's talk about this. When you ask people to classify themselves on that classic seven point scale from very liberal to very conservative, you get a basis for plotting points on a graph depending on whatever other questions you ask them. The questions that are asked in this research are how important are these various factors for you when you think about your moral life? How important are uh, uh, the considerations having to do with harm <coughs> and care? How important are the considerations having to do with justice and fairness? And what about the in-group, out-group considerations? How important are they to you? All the hierarchy things, all the purity sanctity things. So when you find out how important they are to people and you know where they are on a spectrum, this is the graph you get. This is tens and tens of thousands of people producing this graph. Not a, I don't mean researchers, I mean data points. This is a really strong graph. Now what do you see? If you're on the far left, you're saying what's important to me is the harm and care dimension and the fairness and justice dimension. They matter to me, but those other things the in-group, out-group monitoring, the hierarchy, the purity, sanctity thing, I've got real problems with those. And I say they're not important to me. I deliberately suppress them. I suppress the in-group, out-group thing because that leads to things like racism, xenophobia. I, I reject the hierarchy thing because that leads to things like sexism. I, I reject the purity, sanctity thing because that leads to things like homophobia. So on the far left, people are suppressing those aspects and elevating the others. On the far right, everything's sort of together. All five factors are relevant on the conservative and extremely conservative side. Right? So this is the answer to the question about um, how you get liberal conservative connections to the five dimensions of the morality factor. Right? So the thought is that Evolutionarily, we're all built with all five of these moral domains and they all operate at about the same level and that in small scale societies you need all five. You need the harm care stuff, you need the fairness justice stuff, you need the in-group out-group monitoring, you need the hierarchy to stay organised and you need purity sanctity to stay safe. You need all five. In small groups, small towns in America and every other country that this has been studied all over the world, um, uh, you see this, small towns, they tend to be on the right side of this graph with all five things operating. If you've ever moved into a small town as an outsider, especially if you don't look the same or don't sound the same as other people, people are courteous, but they are monitoring, they are watching, they are evaluating, right? Small town culture is right side culture with all five domains active. But in the cosmopolitan coasts of America, where you've got strangers coming in and out all the time and immigrants everywhere, where you've got complicated business transactions, you can't worry about purity rules if you're going to trade with this stranger. What you want to do is trade. So you trade. That becomes more important and you suppress whatever purity rules you've got to do it. Right? And, and you start worrying about hierarchies and you worry about sexism and you fight back against those things. You suppress those things in order to be able to produce a civilizational form that's what you want. So there's a sharp division between the coasts and the, and the center 
of this country over precisely this issue. And if you plot it geographically, it's incredibly illuminating. By the way, there's a little streak of liberalism in the middle running up and down around the Mississippi River. <laughs> Why would that be? Trade. Exactly. It's the great artery of trade in the United States and it formed cultures that were much more eclectic, with a more diverse, lots of different kinds of people. But, in, but away from the major rivers, you don't see that. What, what you see is uh, this conservative picture of all five things operative at the same time. So, moral foundation theory is saying there's a biological basis for all of this. The biological basis delivers you all five moral domains roughly equal in strength. What you do with it after that is up to you. And in a cosmopolitan environment, you suppress three and you elevate two. In a smaller town, conservative environment, more monochrome, racially and culturally, you keep all five going. It's remarkable how strong the stats are. It's one of the best signals in social psychology that anyone has ever gotten in a hundred years of social psychology research. It's a very powerful result. And it helps to understand why people get like this. Because they've got different values at work. Seriously different values. Some people are saying, I don't trust the disgust reaction. And other people are saying, it's God-given, you have to trust the disgust reaction. On homosexuality, for example. So there's a fight over whether or not you should trust that piece of your biology, the piece of your body that causes disgust. And some people say yes, some people say no. And in the process, what you do is, of course, never talk about the issue. You totally hide from that. And instead you talk about the Bible, you talk about authority, you talk about uh, raising of children, you talk about the stability of civilizational forms and traditions and institutions. Talk about everything else except the issue which has to do with whether you trust disgust. Conservative brains do trust disgust. See that face there? Unmistakable. That's the disgust face I was trying to <laughs> simulate earlier today. And there are certain parts of the brain that are involved in that uh, the insula particularly, but this is a hardwired response. You can produce it even in very young children who don't have really any moral sense at all. It's a, it's a very hardwired uh, response. It's built deep into your body. We've all got it, unless you're broken in some way, you've got this response. What you do with it is up to you. Right? You can learn to suppress it. I, I know plenty of people who are disgusted by homosexuality but realize that that's wrong for them to feel disgusted and train themselves not to feel that way. There are plenty of people like that. And there are plenty of people who don't even have that disgust reaction for homosexuality at all. So you see, people are all across the map, but we're all dealing with the same machinery. This is the part of us that we all share. Now some people have this reaction stronger than others. But whether or not it's strong, the difference between conservatives and liberals isn't whether it's strong or not, it's whether you trust it or not. It's a decision you make about whether you're going to trust the disgust response. <coughs> if you're a conservative, um, you also trust fear. The fear response, mostly coming from the amygdalas, it's telling you to be worried about that stranger. You might not be safe, your family might not be safe. You can see how deeply embedded that is in our biology if you just think about our ancient hunter-gatherer kin, right? Fear really mattered. You had to trust fear. If you felt fear, you needed to act. You need to find a solution to the problem. This is serious. Fear mattered. Trust fear. Right? So if strangers come into your neighborhood and you're afraid and you're conservative, you trust that. If you're liberal, what do you do? Hey, hang on. I know you're feeling afraid here, but you're not supposed to be feeling afraid. So fight the fear. Don't go there. Right? What's fear for? Well, it helps you mount a vigorous defense of values. Values really matter. People care about them. <laughs> They're important. And you need to defend them because people compromise them. So that's the human condition, isn't it? Sin, in a nutshell. Compromise precious human values. Who's going to defend them? The people who trust fear. The people who trust disgust. They're the ones who are going to want to defend, and they're the ones who are going to be better at defending values. So what does that mean for conservative church? 
This is a beautiful, elegant piece of research done on communities, special communities that, um, like communes, that lasted a certain number of years. And the question about their longevity was teamed up with the question of how many costly demands they placed on their members. What the graph shows is that if you don't impose many costly demands on your members, you won't live long. If you pose, impose lots of costly demands on your members, you will live a long time. Just in passing, think liberal mainline churches versus conservative evangelical churches on this question. The demographics going down on the liberal end, mainline end, are they imposing costly demands on their members? No. The conservative church demands costly investment. <laughs> I love that picture. Somewhere there's this actual woman in the world who knows this picture's on the web and she must be so proud. I see her with grandchildren saying, here, would you like to see me again? Bringing up the web and showing the picture. <laughs> this is me. <laughs> that is a fabulous picture. Costly investment means you demand in your group that everyone who wants to be a part of your group contribute something and it's going to cost them. And when they do something costly, they're showing a good faith signal that they're committed to the group, which means you can trust them, you can include them, you can use them in shared projects because you agree on something important. Conservative church is also focused on ritual. They know how to do ritual. They're good at that. And we are a ritual species. Ritual goes way, way back before religion in our species. The bodily, rhythmic aspects of ritual are incredibly important. Synchronous motion is really important. The studies on synchronous motion have shown that if you participate in a marching activity or in a clapping activity or in a shared singing activity, afterwards you're much more generous than you were before. It literally transforms you into a more pro-social being. Synchronous behavior mitigates hierarchy tensions. So if you've got a hierarchy, people can get resentful. People at the bottom, they might not be happy. But if you do rituals, the people at the bottom will stop being resentful. You mitigate hierarchy tensions. So it's a huge tool for the conservative church. Oxytocin, the cuddle chemical, when you do these synchronous motion things, there's actually a hormone, oxytocin, that mediates this in the brain. Your brain is primed with this machinery to bond to other people. And if you do the right kinds of things, you release this oxytocin and your reaction is uh, incredibly close feelings to the other people. Right? Usually the people who are in your group. Oxytocin also heightens, um, the, these processes that use oxytocin also heighten suspicion of outgroups. Isn't that interesting? It's a consolidator of in-group behavior. So if you've heard about the universal cuddle chemical, people have probably only told you half the story. It works in in-groups and it, and it increases outgroup monitoring and vigilance. Now where have you seen oxytocin in your own life? Well, if you're a woman and you've ever breastfed, Oxytocin is the hormone that's associated with that letdown feeling that I'm told happens when milk begins to flow. And so it connects you in a highly strongly bonded way to the little infant. Um, if you're human and you've ever had sex, oxytocin is the thing that floods you afterwards, that gives you that calm, connected feeling. When you really would like to cuddle, if one or the other person doesn't just drop off to sleep, right? <laughs> I mean, it's sitting there. It's also there in these ritual contexts, in synchronous motion contexts, when you lift your hands and sing together, when you go on a march. I mean, just think of military training. Military training is about entraining these biological <coughs> capacities in order to produce people who are so loyal to each other that they will do what needs to be done even when their own lives are at threat. Military training is the best expertise area for, the, for marshalling all of this stuff. But churches are pretty good at it too. Which churches? Conservative churches. Liberal churches struggle like crazy. Struggle how? 
See those evangelical Protestants kind of holding their own in the numbers area? But look at those, the black Protestants are doing fine, the Catholics are doing fine. But see those two declining lines, the Anglo-Catholics and the mainline Protestants? They're all liberals. You can believe what you want. There aren't any costly tests imposed. You don't need to demonstrate your loyalty. We're open to everyone. Just come on in, right? Now, I personally love that approach to life. I'm radically inclusive in as many ways as I can possibly be. But I've done enough research to know that if you run an institution that way, it's going to be hard to keep your numbers up. Unless it's a really self-selected group in some special social environment. The human reality here, until we train ourselves to do something different, is that if there are loose or no rituals, if there are no costly signals, if there are no periodic unleashings of oxytocin to bind people together, people get bored and they leave. They stop attending. What about liberal brains? Oh, liberal brains are all about openness to experience. They're seeking novelty. They want the new. They want the different. That's, this is the curiosity part of the human species. We've all got, us, uh, got it in us, right? Um, it varies in strength, and it is true that there's these strength variations produce people who tend to be more liberal and less liberal. That's true. But it's also something that can be cultivated. If any of you have grown up in a conservative culture and you're a hyper-curious kid, you probably had older relatives who were trying to suppress that, who were trying to tell you, hey, Toe the line. Stop fiddling with that. Don't pull that apart. You'll never be able to put it back together. Right? Those kinds of messages are an attempt to, uh, to uh, of course, no one's thinking this way. Uh, I don't mean it that way, but it's an, it's an attempt <coughs> to regulate this curiosity thing, which people know from experience messes with the stability of a small-scale social environment. It causes people who want to leave. It causes people who ask difficult questions. A liberal is simply a person who values individual freedom and who is alive to the dangers inherent in all forms of power and authority, so said Karl Popper, a philosopher of science. I think that's about right. That's a pretty good summary, I think, of uh, what a liberal is. You're willing to go your own way, you're willing to be individual, you're willing to question everything. But church-wise, what does that produce? <laughs> it produces boredom. Why? Because where's the dancing around the fire? Right? Where's the beating of the drums? If you have you ever tried dancing around the fire to drums? I have. You feel the drum beat in your body. It goes through your whole body. That is action. Right? Now where is that in liberal church exactly? Right? you got this nice organ thing. Every now and again, the bass on the organ does something and you feel it in your body a little bit. I noticed that once and I'm thinking, oh, this is the liberal gesture towards fire dancing. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Can't we do better than that? What are we thinking? Why, why do we want to turn our backs on so many inbuilt mechanisms that are built for togetherness? We're all primed for this. The military shows it, conservative shows it, but mainline liberal churches, they don't employ it. Why? Because every time you do, you have these horrible side effects. You increase hierarchicalism. You increase in-group, out-group monitoring. You increase purity, sanctity worries. And so you can't live into your moral vision if you deploy this machinery. It gets in the way. But the price is that kids go bananas bored and they leave. They flood out. So you can think out of the box. That's a great thing about being liberal. You can really think outside the box. You've got more freedom to do that. That freedom's encouraged and you don't use the mechanisms that would suppress it. You can fight oppression. You can see what's going on more easily because you're not as indebted to the way of seeing that's defined by the group that you're strongly bonded to using the mechanisms that I'm talking about. So you can stand outside and see. The liberal church has been at the cutting edge of most of the protest movements in the history of this country. Not all, but most. So then, here's the question. How do we do church together? Is that a ridiculous ideal or is it an implacable obligation? 
I'm arguing that we need each other. We need each other because we're stronger together than we would be alone. Because each of us, each side, has wisdom. We need the wisdom to be combined. And we need a lot of people to understand both sides so that the wisdom can be fully present and vibrant in our communities. Doing church together is a real challenge. Understanding-based empathy really does help us walk alongside one another. At the level of small groups and congregations, we've seen understanding-based empathy make a huge difference. It doesn't change anyone's mind, but it keeps you doing church together despite the disagreements. This is a church where they self-consciously employ understanding-based empathy to hold people together across the ideological spectrum. It's a bell-shaped curve in their ideology, exactly like the wider population. They hold people together, they do communion together, they describe each other's convictions to each other. They stay bonded together. Uh, every committee meeting in this church begins with personal sharing and prayer. Every single committee meeting. You want to talk about the church gutters? First you talk about your spiritual life and we pray together. Right? You want to talk about how to raise money for the next capital campaign? First we share our spiritual lives together and we pray together. So that <clears throat> they're creating methods for entraining the systems that we've got here for bonding with each other that work for a moderate church that tries to work across the, the spectrum. So doing church together, <clears throat> whether it's difficult, whether it's easy, whether it works or not, I think we have to try it because that's what the body of Christ means. That symbol means that we're supposed to be together. Breaking of the bread in the Eucharist isn't a reference to splitting off into churches that are all like-minded, is it? No, it's a reference to all being together in the same body. But just doing it is difficult. Doing it is difficult in precisely the ways I'm talking about. Now, from now, you should be able to see, I think, I hope, why I say that you need the science to understand the religion, right? I'm, I'm talking theology here. I'm talking practical theology, I'm talking ordinary life stuff, but it's all informed by the sciences. And what the sciences are not doing here is dictating the interpretation. They are resources, but they don't determine the interpretation. Now I think that is a sound way to proceed. And I hope I've illustrated it here for you. Unity in the body of Christ is something that's difficult to do, but understanding from the sciences can help us figure out how to do it as well as we possibly can. And when we make strategic choices, we can understand the price we will pay for those choices. If we don't want to do synchronous motion rituals because we're afraid that it's going to reconstitute hierarchy and purity sanctity worries, if we're worried about that, what price will we pay? We can understand the price. And we can go in with eyes open when we think about it. All right, now I've just got to... Um, a couple of things I want to show you. This is going to take just a couple of minutes. I've got three more slides about healthy clergy. So first of all, healthy leadership models unity and diversity, I think. When you, as a church leader, understand ideological difference with empathy, when you can explain the people in your congregation to each other, do you know how relieved people are? How grateful they are? That transformative <laughs> moment you have, you can give to other people. It holds congregations together better. Anxious people feel heard and appreciated. Pastoral stress is lower because you can actually feel as though you're making a difference. Hot button issues are everyone's problem to solve, not just your problem. Right? When you help people understand each other, other people are more committed to figuring out what's going on. And you don't have to be sitting there in the middle, torn apart by warring sides. And the gospel message is clearer and more profoundly countercultural. I really care about this point. I even put it in red. It's important. What's the countercultural message? The body of Christ image is just about the most counterculturally radical thing you can picture. Because you're saying people should be together even when they disagree. That ideology, opinion and behaviour takes second place to being together. This is what Christ's ministry was, Jesus' ministry was to me as I read the Bible. It was about this radical, inclusive destabilization of the biological givens of human life and an invitation to a kind of inclusion and belonging that's quite unusual 
and it's difficult to do. And it's grounded in the fact that we are all loved. All of us. Across the ideological spectrum. Now that's a gospel message. That message preaches. That message preaches beautifully in conservative churches, in liberal churches, in mainline churches, in black churches, in Latino churches. It, prints, it, pre it preaches across the board. I just don't hear it very often. I travel from church to church to church, listening to sermons, analyzing <laughs> worship patterns. Uh, <clears throat> it's rare to hear that message. Why? It's the good stuff. It's the good stuff. It's the closest thing we have to Jesus' own ministry and life, I think. So conflict and clergy stress. It's not just about personalities. That crazy person's giving me a hard time. It's not just about the church budget. It's not just about your meagre salary and the stress that that induces in your family. It's about theologically loaded disagreements with real political and personal stakes. I've tried to describe some of them. It's intellectually confusing, it's emotionally exhausting, and it's spiritually disorienting. So, are you feeling intellectually confused? Then learn. Understand your ideological opponents and how they see their enemies. Maybe you're one of those enemies. Grasp why they're so passionate. Nurture empathy for them. Are you emotionally exhausted? Well, communicate. Test to see whether you really understand what each ideological camp most cares about. Do they recognize your version of their views? Can you be that person or not? There's a, it's amazing how emotionally exhausting it is to feel helpless. But when you communicate, that emotional helpless feeling can actually be mitigated fairly powerfully. You're doing something active. And finally, if you're sp feeling spiritually disoriented, I would like to say get real. In the best sense of that phrase, the God who speaks from the whirlwind is not neatly scaled to human desires. Disorientation might be a sign of leaving old attachments behind. If you're feeling disoriented, it might be because the thing you were used to, which maybe wasn't that great, is starting to crumble. Spiritual disorientation can be a really good thing. It can take you into the next stage of a spiritual journey. You've been great. I appreciate you listening today. We've got a long journey together uh, as we work through the various stages of today. That's going to give me a chance to get to know some of you better. I'm very grateful for that. Please share with me. Talk to me about what's important to you as we go along. And I'm really looking forward to the contact. Thank you. Thank you.